buddy, put that thing back in its holster. We haven't gone anywhere. I don't understand. Check out the MichaelDukesShow.com for information on how to get access to the podcast. The Michael Duke Show. I have two guns, one for each of you. Firearms Friday. As Thomas Jefferson stated, it is the right and duty of the people to be at all times armed. To be at all times armed. Say hello to my little friend! I say that the Second Amendment is, in order of importance, the First Amendment. The right to keep and bear arms is the one right that allows rights to exist at all. The Michael Duke Show. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Not be infringed. Firearms. From my cold, dead hands. Friday. Firearms Friday. Firearms Friday. Hello. And welcome to it. Uh, it is that beautiful day of the week where we sit down and talk about... Uh, Issues related to the Second Amendment and uh, talk about guns and gun rights and just a little bit of everything. It's uh, it's a it's a beautiful day in our neighborhood, my friends, and uh, it's like my two hour weekly therapy session. That's where you get a chance to let my hair down. What little hair I have left? Get let my hair down and uh, and talk about uh, something that I really care about and uh, that I think I'm pretty passionate about. So. Welcome to the program, and thank you for coming on board and joining us today. We've got a whiz bang show. It's a whiz bang. We got. Uh, <clears throat> I should have worn a tie. Should have worn a tie. We've got. Yes, that man from you know Reason Magazine, JD Two Chili, uh, is going to be joining us this morning uh, from Reason. He is a contributing editor over there and of course uh his he's got a laundry list of uh a laundry list of accolades in his biography which we've gone over before he is coming on board to talk with us today about the fifth circuit court of appeals ruling on the um i don't know what they were calling it the 80 percent, the ghost gun ban the parts ban the we can turn anything into a gun ban kind of thing so we're going to talk with jd Tuchilli about that here in just a moment uh, and get uh, his take on this and uh, and more. Uh, and then um, in hour two, it'll be you and me, a little Q&A. We're going to talk about that. And then um, we're going to finish up the show this morning on a lighter note with Willie Waffle for our entertained guest. That is his name. I had somebody ask me that the other day. Is that really his name? And I'm like, yeah, that's his real name. It's not a pseudonym. It's not some pen name. It's not. He's not a SAG-AFTRA member. It's uh, Willie Waffle. I mean, <clears throat> man, his parents must have hated him. Anyway, uh, it's uh, he's going to come on and talk with us about the streams and the movie reviews, the entertainment news. It's just my way to kind of lighten things up before we go on into the weekend. All right, before we jump into it with JD, <clears throat> let me give you the uh, <laughs> let me give you the great news. So, uh, for those of you in South Central uh, and down on the peninsula, well, you might want to leave a little early because all that rain. All that rain and snow and rain and snow mixed and the slush and the zombies dropping from the sky. Well, apparently they're freezing on the road right now. It is, uh, it's like black ice everywhere. There's a special weather advisory for the entire peninsula, all of South Central and into Wasilla. I mean, that's bigger than most states. And uh, it's black ice, the entire, I mean, everywhere, all over the place. 22 degrees right now at the house. And it's snowing on top of that. So just in case you were wondering if you should go brush off the car and leave a little early, the answer to that is yes. And then if you can work from home, thumbs up. Guess who's not leaving this studio today? Thumbs up. That would be me, baby. I'm not going anywhere. I'm working from here today because, dang, who needs that? And, of course, the weather into the weekend is, uh, <clears throat> well, it's it's more it's more of the same here in the South Central area for sure. Uh, lows tonight are going to be around five degrees. The highs are five degrees. The lows are going to be zero to five degrees. Uh, sunny on Sunday with, again, it's going to be cold. 
Monday, sunny, still cold, 15 degrees. And then chance, and all I see for the entire next week is chance of more snow. After the 38 inches of snow, yes, you're going to see more snow. That's just kind of how it is down here. I'm not even going to bother to look at the peninsula. You guys can go out and look at it. But <clears throat> I just wanted to throw that out there. So that you, my son looked at me last night and said, Dad, am I going to have to shovel again tomorrow? Yes, son. You're going to have to shovel again tomorrow. I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. This is a rite of passage. Uh, anyway, so we're going to, uh, I just wanted you to know all that. It's three inches of snow and growing down in the Kenai, Jeannie says in the chat room right now. So anyway, final thing before I got to get to JD. Final thing. We talked about the holiday recipe contest. It is now up on the Facebook page. If you want to contribute a recipe, you could win a bag of Michael Duke Show Beard Curler Coffee, my own personal blend, and a six o'clock club coffee mug. Um, all you got to do is put your recipe up there and then vote on it. You're, you could vote on your own recipe or you could vote other people's or you can vote multiples. Whoever gets the most most votes or thumbs up on their recipes by the 19th of December, we're going to choose. And then we're going to uh, announce the winner on the 20th. And this is really just a secret way for me to get all your secret grandma recipes, right? For the holidays. This is your favorite holiday recipes. And I, I've shared mine. I'm not one of those guys who's like, grandma said I could never share the recipe. No, no, everybody's got to be able to enjoy it. So put your recipes up. There's already a handful of recipes up there, including my grandma face pumpkin pie, which is unlike any pumpkin pie you've ever eaten. It's not thick and dense and like, you know, it's big chiffon, tall, delicious. Go check it out. <clears throat> Facebook.com slash Michael Duke show. All right. I've taken enough time. Good Lord. I was not expecting to go through all that this morning. Let's get to it. The man, the myth, the legend, in my mind, J.D. Tuchilli joins us this morning, senior or, uh, contributing editor for Reason Magazine, who is probably not suffering from 39 inches of snow. Good morning, J.D. Good morning. No, it, it is chilly here. I got to say it was 48 degrees just a little while ago. Oh, OK. Burr, man, that's just <laughs> burr. It's burr, 22 degrees, and, and you know, t I think I here at the house, I think I had 27 inches of snow, and down in Anchorage, they had, up on the hillside, they had 40 inches of snow, uh, and now it's, again, it's been war raining yesterday. It's just, it's a hot mess, man. It's like the, it's like the weather apocalypse or something. Anyway, well, welcome to the program, my friend. Thanks for coming in and joining us. Um, you've been writing about this. You, you and I have talked about it in the past. Things are, you know, kind of changing um, with, uh, with what's going on with the courts. Uh, it's not just Bruin, it's more, some of these courts are starting to really look at this and realize that there's a potential here for the three legs of government. There's an inequity, especially in executive decisions and things like that. So let's talk about the fifth circuit court and how that judge kind of, I mean, they kind of, it wasn't just like a mild rebuke. It was like a slap down of the ATF on, um, I mean, I don't know what they're calling this, the, the ghost gun rule, whatever it is, essentially gun parts, saying that any part of a piece of metal that could eventually be turned into a gun, that railing over there, it's solid metal. It could be turned into a gun one day. That's a gun. And uh, the uh, the courts were not amused. They weren't amused at all. In fact, I don't know that I've ever read an appeals level a decision that was quite this scathing, um, although it does echo the language from the district court. Uh, which is uh, which was the decision that that was bumped up to the appeals level. They tore into the ATF for way overstepping as overstepping its boundaries. Uh, this was a three judge panel. Uh, the two judges in the majority, I should say that all three agreed uh, that the ATF way overstepped its boundaries. The two majority judges in the uh, ruling in the ruling um, were a little more diplomatic and basically saying the ATF had absolutely no authority whatsoever to decide on its own that unfinished receivers are receivers of firearms and that parts kits somehow are also regulatable firearms. The concurring judge who said he joined in overruling the ATF completely uh, was actually was much nastier. I mean, the reason he concurred is he thought the, the other two weren't nasty enough to the ATF. So all three slapped the ATF down real hard. If you've been following along, this is the Vanderstock v. Garland case. Um, has to do with the ATF's uh, administrative rule reinterpreting unfinished 80% receivers, which are very popular for hobbyists, to turn into AR-15s, to turn into Glock-style pistols, to turn into some other.
their firearms um, in their home workshops and to assemble them using parts kits um, as DIY firearms. And the uh, district court first, then the appeals court now, now this has been bumped up, both said that there's a long history of homemade firearms. The ATF had no reason to think that this was a surprise that people make their own firearms and that the ATF has no authority to decide that something it says is not a functioning receiver is a receiver just because at some point it could be turned into a receiver. Uh, the concurring opinion went further and said the ATF apparently wouldn't be satisfied until it had the authority to regulate primordial uh, materials and then to require that they be melted down into ooze at the end in order to yeah. uh, to exit its regulatory authority. It really is right. quite the decision. It really is. I mean, I read a lot of the verbiage and I was like, ooh, ah, oh, ooh, ah. I mean, this is stinging. Uh, when they, they virtually acknowledge that any – any singular piece of metal could be then regulated as a firearm. And they were also very disdainful of the fact that for years, the GCA, the Gun Control Act of 1968, was was interpreted as this way. And then all of a sudden, they decided to read. That was another sticking point of like, you know, you can't just arbitrarily say these have all been legal since 1968. And oh, until this day. And now we've decided they're all illegal. I mean, they're there's some really, and this I think is a good thing for many reasons, firearms, you know, predominantly in this case, but also I think it's a prime example of how a lot of the judicial are starting to wake up to this executive overreach that we're seeing through a lot of these executive actions uh, that have happened from various presidents. I don't care what your what what animal you're wearing on your lapel. It, they're various. This is a dangerous thing. And some of the judges are like, wait a second, um, that's really not your job. You can't really do that. That's Congress's job. Exactly right. I mean, fundamentally, this is not a Second Amendment decision or may go there at some point in the future. This is a decision about the limits of administrative authority. I mean, how much can executive agencies say, well, because the legislators have put us, you know, the president who put us in office uh, can't get their preferred legislation through, how much can we reinterpret existing law to accomplish the same goals anyway? And that's what the ATF does, but it's what a lot of agencies do. The EPA does this, the DEA does this. Um, a lot of administrative agencies just decide on their own they're going to reinterpret existing law because it's too hard to get legislation passed. And they effectively then start throwing people into, into prison for new interpretations of old laws that make things that were perfectly legal last week illegal this week with untouched by lawmakers' hands. Um, and right. the courts are now saying you cannot do this. And just because you've been doing this. And the appeals level borrowed the language. I mean, they echoed what the district court judge had said, which is we, we, we recognize that the ATF argues that they've been doing this all along. The fact that they've been doing this all along doesn't mean that they're authorized to do it. It means that they've been wrong all along. They yeah, no, I, explicit. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I love that phrase because it was like, just because you've been doing it doesn't make it right, essentially. You've been wrong this whole time. You've been illegal and unconstitutional this whole time. And like you just mentioned, the EPA, there was a case here recently where the EPA, the EPA was smacked down hard by the court saying, you're assuming authority that you don't have. And, uh, it, you know, which again, for those of us who are smaller, more limited government libertarian types, that's music to our ears. Do I think it's going to become widespread? Probably not. But every instance of this is better and better. And of course, this is part of a bigger, uh, this is part of that bigger impetus. I'm sure that Biden and company uh, and others are just frustrated that they can't get Americans on board with their gun control agenda, that they just can't get the politicians to, you know, who are afraid of their own shadow to do any of that stuff, which I mean, of course they can't because the politicians understand that the predominant sentiment in the sentiment in the country is leave the guns alone. It's not the gun problem. It's a people problem. It's a mental health problem. It's all these other, I mean, you keep seeing these and more and more of these polls are coming out where when people are asked the, the, the full question, instead of these, Im, Im, you know, implicit questions about, you know, these little short answers, uh, when they get a full detailed uh, set of questions, they're like, whoa, 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 wait a second. No, no, we don't want that. And, uh, and and it's got to be frustrating for them. I think it's enormously frustrating. And and it's become habitual for um, the executive branch in, in, at the federal level, but also at the state level, with the support of sympathetic legislators to try and get their preferred policies implemented by bypassing lawmakers. Lawmakers don't like voting for laws um, that put them on record. 
um, that may get them voted out, as voting for gun restrictions tends to do, or they may come around to bite them um, when the law is not enforceable, when it gets defied in a mass and public way, as happened in New York with uh, requiring the registration of so-called assault weapons. 5% less than 5% compliance, and all of a sudden the lawmakers look like idiots because they're passing laws that uh, don't make any sense. The same thing happened when they tried to ban body armor and they phrased it wrong so that it only applied to soft body armor but didn't apply to armor plates um, and, to, and to plate carriers. So now you can get the good right. stuff, level three and level, you know, level four, you, but you couldn't get the soft stuff that would stop a pistol bullet. Um, I mean, and it was clear that lawmakers had no idea what they were doing and no idea how to write a law that would apply to what they were talking about. They'd much prefer to pass that to, to the executive branch, let regulators do it in the background and implement their policies. And the courts are saying, no, no, you can't do this. If you want to implement a policy, pass that as a law. And if you don't have the right. nerve to pass that as a law or the votes to pass that as a law, you don't get to do it. Right. Well, and there's a danger in that. While we still cheer the fact that New York, for example, less than 5%, Connecticut, the same thing in Connecticut where they had a single digit, uh, I think it was three and a half or something percent compliance after Newtown and all that. You know, while we cheer that as gun owners and as libertarians and people who say encourage civil disobedience on stupid laws, at the same time, it's a dangerous path because it encourages that whole concept of the Irish democracy, right? Because then it, it, it chips away at the legitimacy of the government as a whole because if they keep putting stupid laws in, people start to lose respect for the establishment. And I know you've written about that before, yeah. that yeah. the the confidence in government at almost every level is at a, I think it's a record low, right? I mean, this is like since they've been tracking it, we're down near the bottom. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, I, I wrote about this recently for a, a Canadian publication because, you know, they're always astonished when they see the record, you know, the data coming out of the U.S., and it is uh, U.S. Uh, you know, basically, the U.S. consideration of the legitimacy of the political system is at about a record low. And one of the real dangers of that is that people start considering alternatives and they're open to things uh, such as alternatives to democracy. They were specifically asked about that in the recent poll I saw, which was only about six weeks old. Um, and alternatives to, to democracy being like a strong man ruling without a Congress. So there are real dangers of going down the path of having a progressively delegitimizing government, having laws, even bad laws, laws that we don't want to be enforceable, having the only means to deal with them uh, to be to ignore them. In the end of the day, the whole system goes rotten, collapses, and you might end up with something a, a really a lot worse taking its Absolutely. place. Speaking of a strong man ruling without a Congress, this Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has some interesting backlash because it's also going to be affecting Donald Trump's executive decision on bump stocks. This is the same yeah, kind of yeah. thing. Um, you know, and, and I know people on the show, they're all mad at me for, but I mean, Trump was no better than anybody else. And in fact, for gun owners, I think he was worse. I um, mean, he was quoted right after Parkland as saying when he was talking about uh, red flags and all this stuff. And he said, we'll just take the guns and worry about due process later. If that doesn't make your sphincter slam shut, I don't know what else would, because that is a that's a dangerous thing for a president to say. Then he went ahead and hit with a bump stock ban. But that's falling under the same kind of purview that this whole 80 percent receiver thing is going on. Right. I mean, this is the same kind of issue. Yeah, exa exactly. This is executive branch overreach. And this is the purest form of it, which is a president saying, as he, as Trump said explicitly, I can do what I want because I'm the president. Um, the guy might want to read the Constitution before he runs for the second term, but he can't do that. And the courts are pushing back and saying, no, no, whether it's the ATF um, or the EPA or the president of the United States, the executive branch cannot make policy that is not um, justified by the laws on which it's based. You can't just wave a magic wand and implement a bump stock ban or any other kind of ban or restriction or mandate. It's not within the purview of the executive branch, whether that's in the White House or over in the offices of the ATF. And again, more ramifications as well. It's bump stocks. It's 80 percent. Now it's uh, pistol braces as well. Going to feel the yeah. same thing. Uh, and, and, the, and the similarities between all these things, of course is that uh, they are, uh, we're going to have to go to break. I just realized we got to go to break. I'm late. <laughs> just looked at, I get talking to JD and I forget myself. That's what it is. We got to go. The Michael Duke Show. Common Sense, Liberty Based, Free Thinking Radio. Dang. <clears throat> that was, uh, I just looked up and realized I'm almost a minute late. So hopefully everybody went to commercial break. 
If you're still listening to me on the radio, I apologize. That was my mistake. Uh, but here during, maybe you get a little bit behind the scenes because during the commercial break, we'll usually change uh, gears just a little bit. Uh, so, J.D., yeah, I mean, you're in Arizona. You know, every time I think of Arizona, I'm like, oh, man, that's going to be. But you're in high country, right? I mean, you're you're yes. in the you see snow. You get all that kind of stuff. Uh, what's uh, what's your weather been like now that you got a taste of our weather up here? It's been very pleasant. There's supposed to be a wet weekend. Uh, we're not in snow um, season yet. The real high country is up around Flagstaff. They're at 7,000 feet. You get skiing there. I mean, they a lot of snow. We're on that border here. I'm on that area where we get the snow, but we don't have snow plows. So they pull the road graders out once a year and they tear up all the asphalt because that's the only thing they have to get the snow off the road. And then we got to rebuild the roads afterwards. <laughs> But it's really nice right now. I love getting out and walking my dog in the morning. <laughs> hey, man, they have to use graders up here because the snow gets on there and gets slushy and then melts again. And so you get it's like driving on the surface of the moon. They got to use the graders because it's the only thing that will scrape the, the ice off the pavement, you know. But uh, it is it is what it is. Um, it's uh, I, I everybody's blaming me for the record snowfall because I had everybody do the anti snow dance so we wouldn't have snow until after Halloween, which we did. And then it's all my fault. Uh, Bill Bill says I have a skating rink in my front yard. It's all glare ice on my driveway. Well, break out the skates, my friend. You know we can always make lemonade out of uh, out of lemons. Uh, what's your, fa okay. So, uh, JD, I, you got to go out and put your favorite family recipe on my Facebook, uh, on my Facebook contest for family recipes. This is my way to get everybody's secret family recipe for, you know, their favorite grandma's favorite dish or, you know, uncle Tim's favorite thing that he brought in every year that everybody loved. You got a secret family recipe that everybody loves for the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, et cetera. I have a, I make a chestnut sausage and apple stuffing that I got from my mother. And I love that. Oh. Put that. Yeah, it was originally, my mother originally made that with goose. And then my wife doesn't like goose. So I stuffed the turkey with it now. And uh, that is a tasty one. That is my favorite. I, I got to hunt down the chestnuts sometimes in order to make it. But man, that's tasty. I think yeah, that's the recipe I'll have to hand over there. Yeah, you might have to do that because we have a little, I, we think we're going to have a little hard time finding chestnuts up here, but uh, maybe Amazon can save us and we can, we can get some chestnuts. Uh, but, you know, it seems like I've run this contest probably four or five times in the last eight, nine years. And it seems like the recipes that I always try end up being, I did, somebody put up a cornbread stuffing recipe one year, which was delicious. And then one year there was an oyster stuffing that was just amazing. I mean, it was so rich. Oh man, it was so good. But yeah, sausage, uh, uh, I, that sausage chestnut, that sounds delicious. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm all about that. I put up my grandma Faye's, um, uh, pumpkin pie recipe, which I'm pretty proud of. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a uh, it's quite, it's a different, you know, most pumpkin pies are like, you know, condensed and thick and, you know, it's like, this is like fluffy. It's like a, it's 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 even lighter than a cheesecake it's like really fluffy it stacks way up it's got like eight eggs in it or something and three pounds of butter and i, I don't know but it's <laughs> it's delicious it is absolutely it'll change it's life-changing bill i think in the chat room said he actually made it and uh he's like that was uh that was life-changing so, uh, but it's a good excuse you know i hate this when i'm like oh yes yeah, so it's my grandma's secret recipe i won't share it with anybody why? What do you spread the joy? I mean, spread it out there. It's, you know, well, she made me promise. Well, that was selfish. What happens if you get hit by a car next week? I mean, come on, share that recipe with everybody. It's a, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, I'm reaching that point at the end of the year where I get kind of towards the end of the year and I start losing my focus on politics because I'm just up to here with it, you know? And so then we start talking about this kind of stuff, some of those different Christmas traditions and everything else. Um, it's, uh, it's been, a, it's been a great, uh, it, it's been a great uh, thing to do. And I hope people are getting, and I hope you do share it. That would be good. I, I'll tell Terry, she loves uh, like the chestnuts and the, and the walnuts oh, and all that kind of stuff. And so that, that will be an amazing, uh, uh, an amazing thing. Well, when what I was else? a kid in New York, we used to get the chestnuts roasted from the stands on the street in the city. So I always remember that about this time of year. See, I've never had that chestnuts yeah. roasted on an open fire. I've never had that. Uh, um, I've got to, I get, apparently I've got to experience it. Somebody just said that uh, apparently Safeway car Safeway has chestnuts most of the year. So thank you, Terry. I'll go check out uh, Safeway and see if I can get some there. Uh, all right, here we go. Pop. 
public enema number one. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, enemy. Public enemy number one, which uh, makes more sense. On the other hand, he's a little bit of a pain in the uh, Michael Duke show. All right. Welcome back. Sorry, it was a hot mess there for a minute. We were just talking with uh, JD Tuchilli about his, he says he's going to go post a recipe on our on our recipe contest page. I can't wait. Sausage chestnut stuffing. Oh, baby. All right. Before we went to break, we were talking about, um, you know, all these executive decisions and executive orders that are now being overturned. This obviously is going to have a, a, a bigger impact, and I think continue to have a bigger impact uh, across the country. Uh, we were just talking about the shoulder braces, same kind of thing. I mean, this is we're seeing a pattern, and now we're seeing the patterns starting to be uh, reversed by some courts. This is in front of a three-judge panel. Uh, um, is it uh, it, on bonk? Are they going to pull in the whole circuit? What do you think is going to happen here? Well, with the Vanderstock case, the Supreme Court is is already deciding whether to just kind of jump it up there, which is why the ruling room, the rule from the ATF remains in effect while the Supreme Court decides whether just to accept the case and rule on it because it has such national implications. Um, I think it was Sam Alito, who was the one who who, uh, issued that decision in September. So uh, they may end up bypassing the full uh, Fifth Circuit entirely and bringing the, the Vanderstock case up to the Supreme Court. Well, we should find that out fairly soon. But a lot of this stuff, because it involves similar p- principles, um, again, the uh, the uh, pistol brace case, again, it's administrative overreach. A lot of it is, it's not even Second Amendment. It's about how far can administrative agencies go in just creating law. And the decision in that case, I tell you, was was pretty scathing too. I mean, the judge basically told the ATF, well, of course, it, you know, when you've got people who oppose policies, they're going to find creative ways of, of, of uh, disobeying them. And that's why you end up with pistol braces that, oh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, can be used as shoulder stocks. And he says, it's not surprising that people found a creative way of doing this. And just because you resent that doesn't mean you can go ahead and ban them all on your own. And and I think that this, as you said, this is not necessarily just a Second Amendment issue. If the Supreme Court takes this over, um, it you know it will probably come out of a gun case, but I think it will have far-reaching implications. Especially, you know, I don't know how they could amalgamate the cases from like the EPA and some of these other things, but I mean, it would have far-reaching implications on the power of executive orders or even just administrative directives. There have already been the last two, three years, uh, several cases, the Supreme Court level slapping down in particular the EPA, because one of the biggest offenders, as, as you mentioned earlier, is the EPA in terms of implementing environmental rules that Congress couldn't pass, wouldn't pass, whatever. They, they just didn't go through the normal lawmaking process. And so the EPA invents something out of whole cloth to define a range of gases or whatever it might be as pollutants that it can regulate. And the court and the Supreme Court has been very explicit about saying, no, you can't do that on your own. You don't have that authority. I don't know if they can consolidate them um, if they're too broadly you know, dispersed in terms of uh, the roots of the cases. But if the principles get touched upon and they're broad enough principles, they'll be applied across the board. It doesn't matter which agency did the ruling to begin with. Yeah, I would be surprised if they couldn't find a way to take these three gun cases, at least, and bring them all in because they're all being basically promulgated under the GCA or the NFA uh, and bringing those together. And they're all just substantially similar, essentially the same kind of thing. It's a reinterpretation. You're basically reinterpreting laws that have already been established. I mean, there are 12 determination letters uh, that I know of. For the pistol braces alone, determination letters are basically the ATF telling the manufacturers, these are wholly legal, you're good to go, you can go do it, and now they're coming back in and saying they can't. Same kind of thing for the bump stocks and the and everything else. So, I mean, just to arbitrarily change the rules, and that was one of the, I don't think it was this ruling, it was another ruling, where the judge basically said something along the lines of, you've given everybody these the green light, they've invested money, they're doing all these things, you've told them it's legal for years, and now you're essentially yanking the rug out from underneath of them. And uh, I mean, he said that unconstitutional, but almost like it's un-American to do that kind of thing. This bait and switch when the average, uh, something about when the average consumer or the average citizen can't understand the vagaries of the law, is is the law even worth it at that point? And that's, I mean, that's some, uh, some hard stuff there. 
Yeah, I mean, and, and there were elements of that in both this appeals level decision, the Vanderstock case, and also the dis the earlier district level decision, where the court said you've been issuing these letters for years, uh, you've been telling people that um, eighty percent receivers and, and parts kits are perfectly legal, um, and you've been and people are making their decisions, and then without the law changing, you're now going to threaten people with prison. Um, and that is something that, and they point to that as something that is really beyond the purview of administrative agencies. You might be able to interpret the law, but you can't make new law up when you've been assuring people for years that the law said one thing, and now you can't decide that it says another. Do you think, uh, and this is where you put on your commentator hat, um, do you think, not that you haven't, but I mean, you know, we go pure commentary at this point. Um, but do you think that this is going to have wider spread ramifications on things like the uh, you know, the the kind of the arbitrariness of the NFA over the length of rifles or maybe even touch on suppressors or some of these other things where, uh, you know, for years, all these things were legal. I mean, hell, you could order suppressors through the mail. You could do all this other kind of stuff, you know, back in the day. Do you think that this is eventually, you know, going to chip away at some of the stuff that the ATF has done and that and that the NFA is allowed? Or is that still kind of set in stone to your mind? The NFA, it's a, the NFA is a bad law, um, and part of the problem with it is, is that a lot of these stuff that's in there. I mean, the, the whole short ba barreled rifle uh, phenomenon is an artifact of the, of the of an earlier draft of the NFA that was originally going to very heavily regulate handguns, and the lawmakers in Congress realized that they couldn't get that through. But when they revised and pulled that section out, they did not change the definition of rifle that would differentiate between a rifle and a handgun. Because it was shorter, it would be a handgun, and it would be subject to something like what we see with modern regulation of suppressors. Um, so that's an artifact. Why would you regulate a short-barreled rifle if you're not subjecting handguns to the same kind of regulation? It's only because they left it in there by accident. So um, the NFA is really just a messy law. Problem is, it's actually a law. It was passed. So to get rid of it, either you rule that it's in violation of the Second Amendment, um, and that may be coming down the pike, or you've actually got a Congress, and this is where having Congress do something would actually be beneficial, repeal the NFA. I mean, I would just love to see the whole thing repealed and not replaced. That would be wonderful. But I don't know we're going to get that. Um, and I don't know that the courts are going to go so far as to, as to try to parse the bits of the NFA that really don't make sense, because that's, right. that's outside of their authority. Well, they might be able to declare components of it unconstitutional. I mean, because in the common use feature, right? I mean, machine guns, that's a set pool. There's only about 270,000 NFA class listed machine guns in the country. But suppressors, short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns, all these other things, there are millions of them in the country. So they are in common use. There might be an ability or a component to at least declare portions of that law unconstitutional, especially when you look at some of the Scandinavian countries where they're selling suppressors out of hardware stores. Yeah. If you have a rifle, now they permit their rifles, right? I mean, that's a kind of a heavily regulated process. But if you want a suppressor, you walk into a hardware store and you buy it. And in fact, they suggest that you do for the safety of your hearing and your neighbors and being polite and everything else here, they act like you're trying to handle plutonium or something to get a suppressor. So maybe, I don't know. What are your thoughts here for the next minute? Yeah. Suppressors in particular, especially since you've had such growing interest in suppressors over the last few years, I mean, you know, that $200 tax stamp, uh, given what the government's done to the dollar, it isn't as prohibitive as it was back in 1934. So it's much easier and much more desirable to own a suppressor now than it was then. I can easily see them saying, you know what, this law doesn't make sense. These are in common use. And I think that AR-15s and other so-called assault weapons are safe. They are very much in common use. Right. 20 million plus of them, those are common use. Well, uh, and th that's an interesting bit of history when you just mentioned the devaluation of the dollar and everything else that went on. You have to realize that during the U.S. v. Miller, which was the case that decided the NFA, with, there's a, we could do a whole show on U.S. v. Miller and how that was bad. But essentially, that case revolved around a shotgun that was too short. Um, and they said, well, he could have just he could have just bought the tax stamp, put it on the NFA, uh, you know, paid his tax. But you got to realize at the time that was a two hundred dollar tax and the shotgun cost five dollars. It was yeah. a five dollar yeah. shotgun and they wanted him to pay a two hundred dollar tax on on that uh, shotgun. And so what Congress was trying to do was not trying to tax or, regu uh, or, or regulate. They were trying to prohibit. They were trying to make it prohibitively expensive for any American to have something that they deemed was too dangerous. Uh, luckily, 
that amount has never been changed. If they, if you had adjusted for inflation, tax stamps for those kind of stuff would cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And, uh, you know, so that's, again, Congress was trying not to enforce, but to prohibit people from buying guns. And, the, and they knew the Second Amendment would not permit an absolute prohibition, which is why they used the workaround of a tax. Yeah, no, it's it's frustrating stuff. All right, final break. J.D. Tuchilli, we're going to continue with him here in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. The Michael Duke Show continues. Look, I'm on time this time. So we're going to continue here in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. Common Sense, Liberty-based, free-thinking radio. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Running on 100% pure beard power. Oh, also some coffee. We dip our beard in coffee. Ha, <laughs> nice beard. The Michael Duke Show. Okay. Uh, in the break. Uh, ready to go here. Let me see what, uh, see if there's anything people they've been talking about they were talking about your recipe sausage gins oh mm, everybody wants some of that stuff <laughs> uh, yeah everybody wants some of that stuff you're gonna now you've you've done it man you're gonna have to put up or shut up and you have to post it on there i'll get that uh, up there yeah atf can enforce laws however they cannot make laws they can go to congress and suggest something can become a law they tried to outlaw bump stocks but their agency does not have the power to do congress's lawmaking branch not agencies of the government until a law is passed by congress the atf can go pound sand and and but this is this is not something that is unique to the firearms industry or even the epa congress has abdicated their authority in so many ways, they used to pass laws that were detailed and dedicated, and now they're pass they're passing these broad, open frameworks of laws, and then turning them over to the agencies to make the details and the regulatory details. Uh, because they just, like you said, they don't want to be caught on record offending someone, and it's become just kind of this game of three card monty. Yeah, Congress is essentially non functional and has been for. I mean, it's hard to say there's a, there's a, there's a, a hard break, but I would say at least 20 to 30 years. Um, it has not been doing its job as a legislature. It's simply been passing, as you mentioned, at best broad framework laws and then letting the administrators fill in the gaps as whoever they want to, which is an abdication of responsibility. I mean, the real example of that, of course, is its failure to pass a budget in something like uh, 17 out of the last 20 years. Um, I mean, it doesn't. They just pass these continuing resolutions on spending. And that's why our spending is uh, federal spending is so wildly out of control. Well, if they can't control how much money they're going to spend, they're certainly not going to uh, define what it is that's going to get a person thrown into prison that was legal yesterday that's illegal today. They don't want to be on record for doing that. They like right. being ele elected to office. They like making money from their positions. They like being in front of TV cameras. But they don't want to go on record as threatening Americans, permitting one thing and banning another. And so you end up with administrative agencies filling the gap. And it's good to see courts step up now and start setting some boundaries on that. Well, and I don't think that they see this is not what the framers intended. The framers did not intended Congress to micromanage aspects of people's lives. Um, and we know that they don't have the expertise to even do that. I mean, we, we got the whole Tucker Carlson asking uh, Carolyn McCarthy what a barrel shroud is. And she says it's the shoulder thing that goes up. But a barrel shroud was a major component in the assault weapons ban, right? Yeah. Uh, threaded yeah. barrel, you know, pistol, all these things. They have no idea what they're doing when they make these laws. I think the framers, they never intended them to get down into the weeds level at this. It was supposed to be about defense and infrastructure, and essentially that was it. And the federal government has taken on such a broad role over the last 240 years that the framers would not even recognize it at this point, that they are basically inveigled into every aspect of our lives. It would be the reason Congress does this whole broad thing is not only do they not want to go on record, they don't want to be burdened with all that work. They'd have to be experts in almost every field that they made laws about. Yeah, I mean, this is where some insights from economics come in. I mean, the economist Friedrich Hayek made his name talking about how government could never know how different industries work, what the various values and preferences of consumers are, how much people value one thing over another thing, because that's a constantly moving target that's determined by millions of individual decisions. 
if you're going to try to micro-regulate um, a, a, a society, it's the same thing as trying to run a socialist economy. You have to be an expert on everything, especially as people change their behavior in response to what you just did. And you can't. There is no way to do that, which is why you end up with lawmakers who have no idea what they're doing. And then administrative experts, supposedly at ATF and, and uh, EPA, who try to fill in the gaps and then find out that everyone's working around their new interpretation of the regulation. And it ends up being a giant game of whack-a-mole across your entire society. And that's what they're doing. Yeah, that's what they've ended up doing right now. And again, I think that's where people are starting to see. And you're starting to get some of this pushback uh, from a variety of people. I think COVID, uh, you know, I keep saying that there's only really been a couple silver linings to COVID. And there might actually be three or four. You know, of course, the 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 exposure of what schools are really all about and the fact that homeschooling is not as hard as they said. You know, the whole telework thing and remote work thing, I think, has been a silver lining. But also the fact that people were starting to see that, you know, things like the gun laws, they went out to get a gun during this uncertain time and they found out it wasn't easier to get a gun than a library book. They looked at all these bureaucracies and they're seeing these things go around and they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I think people's eyes are being open to a lot of the overreach the government has in our lives yes i mean it distort the uh, pandemic distorted our society it made people feel like they had to take care of themselves and it may gave them insight into how the officialdom works and they didn't like what they saw they had to fill out a 4473 they saw what their teacher on zoom was saying to their kids yeah no and that was that was the big thing kids you know parents standing over children's shoulders yeah. going what are you teaching my kids what what about the ABCs and one, two, threes? What is this about socially performative, whatever? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's insane. All right, we're going to continue here in just a moment. Um, we're going to uh, continue. JD to Chile, our guest. Uh, this is so much fun. Uh, we're going to continue uh, right now. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio. Here we go. Listen close. What the hell is an assault weapon? You know, if we could just figure out how to get all of the murder guns and the attack guns and not keep selling those to people and just sell protection guns, I think that would be great and solve a lot of problems. Does this mean that if we hurt your feelings, you'd consider the Michael Dukes show assault radio? <laughs> okay, we can live with that. Here's Michael Dukes. That's right. I bet JD and I, I bet we don't have any murder or attack guns between the two of us. I bet they're all protection guns, JD. Mine were lost in a tragic boating accident out in the desert. Oh, man. Now you're going to have to go buy more protection guns. <laughs> just... <laughs> wait, wait, a boating accident out in the desert. Okay, I got that. All right, that's fine. <laughs> it's just, you know, mine were destroyed in a magma flow that erupted from my garage. It was amazing. Um, so anyway, JD, uh, we're going to continue here. Um, you know, it's not just the executive overreach that we're starting to see, uh, come under scrutiny and come under fire. I know you've written a bit about this. I know Jacob Sullivan has written a bit about this, but now we're starting to see some of these fringe laws, um, are starting to be, uh, are starting to be dismantled. The Lautenberg amendment, for example, uh, you know, some DUI convictions. I know in some states, people who are using medical marijuana or recreational marijuana in states where it's legal, there's a lot of cases that are now coming up and percolating through the courts that are looking at the constitutional uh, uh, aspect of whether or not for these arbitrary other reasons people can be denied and become prohibited people. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, DUIs, uh, various uh, you know legal uh, transgressions, uh, state by state. Uh, marijuana is a big one. I mean, if you use medical marijuana, theoretically, you're not supposed to be or any kind of marijuana. You're let me interrupt you. For just, let me interrupt you for just a second. I think even bigger than that is the use of personal protective orders, domestic violence or protective orders, because they are used so much in divorce cases. They're used as a legal weapon, not because one spouse is abusing or scaring, but it is just it's because it's so vindictive in a lot of ways. They issue the order and that can make you a prohibitive person. I mean, how many people get divorced in this country every year and could have a, a protective order put against them and they could lose their gun rights over that? I mean, yes, it's one of them, but it's just it's a it's a it's a huge number. And the courts are starting to stroke their beards and go, wait a minute. 
Uh, that's exactly right. I mean, protective orders, which have been morphing into red flag laws. I mean, what judge is going to turn down a protective order and risk that the guy really is nuts um, or that the woman really is nuts because they don't want to be on the firing line for that. So they just issue the order. And, th and then that theoretically strips you of constitutionally protected individual rights. Would we allow that? Would we allow a protective order to strip someone of their right to free speech or uh, of their protection against having their home searched on a regular basis without any due process. It's the same kind of a thing. These are individual rights. And I like to see courts pushing back, and they are doing this. They're saying, no, no, no. The bar here is way too low for stripping people of their liberty. Um, yes, there may be a risk, but there may always be a risk. And a protective order, I would certainly say, is way too low because there's no due process involved in most of those whatsoever. And then if you go larger than that, the very politically popular red flag laws, very little due process in those at all. Usually you got to peel after the fact. And that's um, way too easily a means of stripping people of their liberties. I mean, and that's the problem <clears throat> that the, the, the whole problem here. And again, this goes back to my comment that Trump made was we'll take the guns and worry about due process later. Anytime any politician or bureaucrat or government functionary says we'll worry about due process later, that should be I mean, not to be too punny, but that should be a huge red flag that they're worried. Due process is the cornerstone of our legal system. That is, I mean, that is what we were, that's what the framers, that's what the revolution was about, was about due process and representation and all this kind of stuff. And we've got law after law being passed across this country that would strip you of constitutional rights with no redress. Or even if you do have a redress, now you have to pony up thousands of dollars to defend yourself over some spurious or anonymous complaint against you. That is a, I mean, that is a huge, huge problem uh, in the country. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing this and to pull in a related issue, you know, it's not firearms related, but civil asset forfeiture, the same thing, the bar for oh, taking yeah. people's property is way too low. Uh, because it's, it descends from archaic laws in which the legal process is, ag is against the money or the property, not against the person. And since the money or the property doesn't have the rights of a person, yeah, we're just going to seize your life savings here or your car and leave you by the side of the road. And uh, a lot of police departments and law enforcement agencies have been enriching them this way for decades now. It's entirely out of control. Some towns actually make a significant amount of their, their revenue by stopping travelers and grabbing whatever valuables they have if they can't demonstrate that they uh, are not using it for criminal purposes. And then you get to sue afterwards to get it back. It's the same thing. Way too low a bar in order to violate people's rights and, and, and uh, curtail their liberty. Some departments are receiving upwards of 60 plus percent of their revenue from civil asset forfeiture. That yeah. is that is an astonishing number uh, when you look at it. And like you said, when you don't have the resources to, they've just taken all your resources. Uh, the story of the guy who took $90,000 and he was going across country to buy a, I think he was going to buy a truck or something. And it was his life savings. And they seized it because he couldn't prove that he was going to buy drugs, not going to buy drugs. And now, how do you fight it? They've taken all your money. How do you fight it? Um, and it is it is just an appalling process of, uh, out there. But it, that is also starting to see some pushback uh, from the some of the courts and some of the lawmakers. Quite a lot. I mean, when when very obviously law enforcement agencies are basing their budget estimates on how much money they're going to get, they're going to make from civil asset forfeiture. It's clearly a revenue uh, raising scheme and it's not a law enforcement or you know, a means of maintaining the peace. And when it became that obvious, some courts, I think, had to respond. And some and some legislatures have been good, too, about curtailing state asset forfeiture. Um, although it has, we need more work at the federal level because too many local agencies then partner with federal agencies and use the well, federal yeah. forfeiture laws. Yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, the federal government is the biggest culprit here because they have a program that allows the share of that revenue with the local departments. If the department sees it and then turn it over to the feds, then the feds have got the big guns to do whatever. And then they share a portion of it back. In fact, when they looked at, I can't remember what the number is, but we're talking about it's billion. It's over a billion dollars in asset forfeiture. I mean, it's yeah. it's bigger than some crime out there, right? I mean, it's a bigger thing than some, I mean, it is crime, but it, you know, than other illegal means, it is one of the biggest takes on American, on the American pocketbook. 
Absolutely. I mean, the, and I want to point to the Institute for Justice, which does excellent work on asset forfeiture and puts out a report every couple of years in the state of it. And it's a huge amount of money that's involved. A lot of Americans who are involved. And the federal law that you mentioned um, is, is, is a policy that's meant to bypass state laws that are supposed to reform the use of civil asset forfeiture. Because states obviously can't curtail federal uh, activities if they're based on federal law. They don't have that authority. And so you get local law enforcement agencies uh, you know, teaming up with the DEA or whoever it might be, and then stealing private property, and then you got to sue to get it back, and you're mostly out of luck. Talk about a racket. Talk about RICO, right? I mean, talk about, you know, where they're intentionally, by, if a state doesn't have a law about asset forfeiture or their laws are too stringent, they just turn it over to the feds and then the feds give them back a lion's share of it, 60, 70 percent of it, and keep the rest. Talk about a racket against the American people. I mean, if more people understood asset forfeiture, J.D., I think it would be there would be people who are up in arms about it. When you read story after story after story of people having money, properties, vehicles taken, it's it is it's infuriating. It's enraging for me personally. It's theft. It's outright theft. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Last two minutes here, J.D. Uh, what else are you working on? What are we you know, where are we looking at? Are we waiting for this case to go up to the Supreme or is anything else happening? Give us the last word here for the last couple of minutes. Well, gun-wise, yeah, we have to wait and see what the Supreme Court does. The Fifth Circuit has very clearly signaled that they're not happy with the ATF making up its own rules. If it's up to the Fifth Circuit, this is done. And what was interesting is that the district uh, judge had uh, had voided in its entirety the ATF rule. The, uh, the panel at the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals voided that, you know, the overruling of the, of the, uh, the ATF rule. Uh, you know, of the ATF rule and sent it back to the district judge. But they did not, the language was so strong that they're not signaling they want a lesser remedy. And if you look at the concurrence, they actually may want an even stronger remedy. Everyone's kind of looking at this. I talked to Cody Wilson uh, the other day about this case. Cody Wilson is the guy who made the first 3D printed uh, right, gun. Defense distributed, yep. and, and he's looking and he's kind of waiting for that, for the, uh, the district judge to issue an even stronger uh, decision in this case, a stronger ruling against the ATF. And I'm, I'm intrigued to see where this, this outcome is going to be. Um, but of course, that's if the Supreme Court itself doesn't decide the case. We've got to see what they do. And of course, this is just at the district level. Of course, it's got to amalgamate across the country. Other courts have got to stand up. Uh, but I mean, it's a good, I tell you, some of these cases are a good reason to become members of the GOA or the Firearms Policy Coalition and give those guys money because they're plaintiffs in a lot of these cases. And as a member, you are exempt from those laws because they're in court process right now. So um, if you got, if you got a bump stock or you got, say, you may want to throw a few bucks at uh, GOA or, or uh, FPC to make sure that you're covered under that stuff. JD, anything else you're working on here? About 35 seconds. Absolutely. I've got a piece up today on how taxes do drive migration. There's actually a lot of evidence for the fact that people leave low, uh, leave high tax states and migrate to low tax states, take their businesses with them, take their jobs with them. And then those jobs end up as draws for other people who aren't actively considering taxes, but are looking at the better economic environments that low tax states create for the people around them. So taxes are important while we're deciding where to live and work. Yeah. Big surprise, right? Big surprise. We're looking at you, California, to Texas Pipeline. We're looking at you. That's what's going on. J.D. Tuchilli, Reason Magazine. Thank you, my friend. Merry Christmas. Happy uh, uh, Thanksgiving. We appreciate it. Hold the line for just a second. Folks, we're out of time for hour one. Hour two is dead ahead. Oh, God, I, I just I felt my blood pressure rising when you started talking about asset forfeiture. It's we we should have you back on to talk specific because I know you've written pretty extensively about oh, yeah. that. And there's actually there's many people at Reason that have been covering this article or this issue from various angles. Um you know, it is, it's just, it's outright theft. When you've got people who are ostensibly sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States and they are just arbitrarily seizing money from law-abiding citizens who are just going about their, and you, some of these stories, somebody gets stopped, they happen to admit that they have $7,000 on them because they're going to buy a car or another car or, or doing something or what, I don't care. I mean, 
carry $7,000 on you if you want. But because they couldn't prove that they weren't going to buy drugs, it gets seized. And then they seize the car. You loan your car to a friend. The friend smokes a joint someplace that they're not supposed to or whatever. They get caught. They seize your car. It's your, you know, it it is just, and some of the stories are even worse than that, J.D. Oh, they absolutely are. And because technically the legal proceeding is against the property and you don't have the full rights adhering to property as to people, the uh, the burden of proof is completely flipped. They require that the person who owns the property prove that they're innocent. I mean, that's not what our what our criminal courts are supposed to do. And it's almost impossible to prove you're innocent. What am I contemplating in my mind? I can't tell you. I, you know, how am I going to demonstrate that to you? And so the cops know that and they they get to seize your property. And good luck to you if you can get a piece of it back and sue and maybe two or three years down the line gets what's left of your car back out of the impound lot where it's been rotting the entire time. That's the thing. I, there was a story that came out here, I don't know, it was a few weeks ago about a lady whose car, she'd loaned it to her son, who apparently was a drug user. He got pulled over. They seized her car um, and she couldn't get it back. It took her three years to finally get the courts to release her car back to her. She'd lost her job. She'd lost her house. She couldn't have, you know, she couldn't receive notices of the hearings because she, she couldn't pay her cell phone. I mean, her whole life fell apart when they took her vehicle. You know, some people are living on the edge like that. Some people just couldn't go out and get another car. She's probably making payments on that car as it sat in the impound lot. You know what I mean? It's oh, yeah. it's it's just it's infuriating. Yeah, I mean, you still owe that you still own that car, even if you have no access to it. It's locked away behind a high gate someplace, and they may at some point auction it off for parts, then give you a few dollars for it. Maybe I mean, if you're lucky. But you're still responsible for it. And like you said, I mean, you still have got to make the payments. If you bought that car new and you still owe a lot of cash, you still owe the cash. Right. You're still on the hook. I mean, whether you got the car or not, they might come after you and say, well, we can't repossess a car because the federal government or the police have it. So we're just going to sue you for the remaining $20,000 on the car that you owe. I mean, how many of, I mean, how many people would be put into bankruptcy over something like that? I mean, it. It is ostensibly from an agencies that are supposed to serve and protect, right? Yeah, I, and it's the, the biggest example. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was going to say it was the biggest example of, of what are the priorities for law enforcement agencies and other government agencies. It's not protecting us at all. It's serving themselves. Serving themselves, furthering their cause, furthering their power, building up their budgets. Uh, like you said, there are whole, there, especially some of these smaller more rural departments where they're using this asset forfeiture against people who are transiting their state. You know, they got an interstate or something or something close to them and they'll be stopping people all the time and they're building their whole. I mean, there was one, I can't remember. It was a little County of like 6,000 people that had like a bear cat armored car and all this other kind of stuff that they were, they were buying and they were buying all this stuff. And turned out a lot of it was being purchased with asset forfeiture money that they were getting from out of staters who were transiting through their community. I mean, what kind of signal does that send for people in your community? I mean, that's <clears throat> we should we should have a show about this, JD. I'll I'm, be more than happy to do it. Stand and deliver yeah. the modern highwayman. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Talk about cut purses and and foot pads. I mean, wearing badges. That's the that's the worst part. So maybe next month, uh, sometime early in the month, if you got time, we'll uh, we'll pull you on and we'll have a full hour show on. Uh, on uh, on asset forfeiture and where it's going. Although, again, as I said, some courts are starting to recognize it and some states are starting to pass laws. The problem, of course, is the federal government being able to bypass those laws by having them just shuffle it over to the feds and then getting money back. So uh, anyway, uh, J.D., my friend, thank you so much. It's always a fun show with you. It always goes way too fast. And uh, I love talking to you. So thanks. Thanks. Thanks for coming on board. Thank you for having me on. You take care. All right, appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to that recipe. Don't, 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 don't shine me on. Don't do it. I'll post that. I will post that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, JD Tuchilli, our guest uh, from Reason Magazine, uh, contributing editor over there. Mmm, sausage chestnut apple. Yes, please. That sounds delicious. All right. Um, mm, okay. Sorry, I just got a notification from my virusware. That was not bad. Okay, here we go. Due process later is an oxymoron, says Brian. Oh, damn, that's slow. I just clicked it. 
and it's not even showing up yet. Which you know what that means. That means at the top of the hour that you and me, you're going to have a blue screen for about 15 seconds during the theme song uh, as I uh, as I reload the page. Oh, it's still not coming up. Holy cow. Okay, so we're going to uh, we're going to continue here in just a moment. Yeah, JD is great. Um, uh, taxes do drive migration. Thank you, JD says Donna. Yeah, this is this article. I didn't, I haven't got a chance to read it yet, but it's on my to-do list for this morning, uh, over at reason magazine. Uh, JD is the bestest guest. <laughs> he is, he's good. I just, he's so good. Uh, he and Jacob sell. I mean, you know, there's just the whole crew at reason there. They do such a great job. They really, really do. And they're so approachable. I mean, if I contacted a writer to another national magazine, I doubt they'd give me the time of day. People like JD and Jacob Sullum and Eric Bame and all those folks over there at Reza, Emma Camp, they're great folks. All right, we are out of time. Hour two is right now. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio. Put that thing back in its holster. We haven't gone anywhere. I don't understand. Check out the MichaelDukesShow.com for information on how to get access to the podcast. The Michael Duke Show. I have two guns, one for each of you. B -b -b Firearms Friday. As Thomas Jefferson stated, it is the right and duty of the people to be at all times armed. To be at all times. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Not be infringed. Firearms. From my cold, dead hands. Friday. Take my rifle, this is my gun. This is for my, this is for my. Firearms Friday. Firearms Friday, your chance to sound off on issues of a two-way nature right here on The Michael Duke Show. Hello, my friends. Hello. It is uh, it is a uh, beautiful, beautiful day out there uh, in, uh, in Alaska, wherever you're at. It's obviously beautiful wherever you're at. Uh, current, uh, currently about 22 degrees outside the old uh, studio here uh, in, uh, in the Matsu. A uh, little snow, some areas of rain snowing down on the peninsula. Fairbanks, I haven't heard from Fairbanks this morning, but I don't, they haven't gotten much snow. Somebody said, please send them some snow because they haven't gotten a whole lot up there. They did get a little snow and rain here a few weeks ago at the same time, but not a lot of snow, which uh, I guess in some ways you could be thankful for. But uh, anyway, it is... Uh, <clears throat> It is uh, just another uh, just another great day here. I hope you're ready for it. I hope you're ready for the weekend. Next week is Thanksgiving. Oh my gosh! I mean, that means what are we? We're thirty days, twenty five, uh, thirty. I mean, we're thirty five days, thirty eight days away from Christmas. Whew, man, just it's like a roller coaster. You cannot get off of it. It's uh, it's going on. It's fast. It's happening right now. Um, so anyway, it is, uh, it's, it's Friday, which is our chance to sound off on issues of a to a nature. Uh, we talk about the second amendment. We just finished up with JD to Chile, who has written, um, extensively about some of the, uh, uh, latest rulings, his most latest, his most latest. Wow. His latest article over at reason magazine talking about it is, uh, I just posted it up in the chat room talking about the fifth circuit and their scathing it was a three it was a three judge panel of the fifth circuit and they wrote a scathing opinion s just slapping the p wadden out of uh, the atf over their overreach um my favorite i think my favorite part of the uh of the decision was where they said 
you've been justifying this by saying, hey, look, we've been doing it already and that's it. And that doesn't make it right. It's still unconstitutional. That was one of my favorite. It was one of my favorite parts of that decision because they're like, just because you've been doing it doesn't mean it's legal or constitutional or right. So stop it. I just, I just love it. Oh, man. Uh, so anyway, if you missed that interview with JD, which actually ran a little bit far afield, we started talking about asset forfeiture and some other things. And during the break, he just agreed to come back on the program in the next uh, this next month. So within the next couple, three weeks, we'll have him back on for a show on a regular weekday to talk about asset forfeiture and what a absolute horrendous um I mean, it's just, it's, it's insane. It, it, asset forfeiture in this country is an abomination that needs to go away. And, uh, so we're, we're going to do a, <clears throat> we're going to do a full one hour, uh, uh, deal on that sometime here in the next two or three weeks with JD, he has been kind enough to, uh, uh, to join us on that. Um, Jacob Sullivan from reason magazine has also been writing, uh, about, uh, a lot of these court cases, his latest piece, which came out just a couple of days ago, um, talks about the bump stock ban, which is uh, under a lot of pressure all of a sudden. And um, you're seeing right now that um, uh, that the Supreme Court is, or excuse me, that the, the uh, district courts and circuit courts are all now coming down on the side of the bump stock uh, owners basically saying um, that you can't change the rules. You can't change the definition. You can't send out determination letters to different manufacturers to say these products are legal and lawful and then change that tune a couple of years later because somebody in the White House decided it was a good idea. Uh, even the even the orange Cheeto guy. Yep. Even him. He can't just arbitrarily from on high come down with a law and say or come down with an idea and say it's law because I said so. And uh, so Sullivan's got some articles on that as well. And Jacob's also written another article talking about um, the loss of gun rights because of like misdemeanor convictions like DUI and uh, some issues over the Lautenberg Amendment and uh, and uh, protective orders and everything else. There's been a lot of good writing at Reason Magazine lately on this stuff, and I'm I'm hoping that more and more of you are going over there and uh, checking them out on a daily basis, uh, and maybe throwing a little money in their kitty. I I subscribe to Reason every year uh, because it is a fantastic outlet for all different kinds of uh, issues. Uh, uh, at, from a from a I think a real common sense smaller government libertarian perspective, and I hope you guys are all going out there and uh, um, and and viewing that. Well, we got some um, we got some stories to talk about, and uh, it's uh, it's interesting to watch uh, some of the news media outlets uh, go through some of these issues, and every now and then uh, somebody. Um, I don't know if they grow a conscience or all of a sudden the, 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 the scales fall away from their eyes and they all of a sudden see a blatant truth that they didn't notice before. We're going to get into that here in just a minute. A Milwaukee paper, uh, discovered this here recently, and we're going to talk about that. We've got some other stories as well. Um, I can open up the phone lines. I suppose I should, I suppose I could get that going on right now. We'll open up the phone lines and see what you guys have to say. If there's anything that you'd like to talk about for Firearms Friday, then now would be the uh, the time to do it. And then uh, we're going to be joined by Willie Waffle from wafflemovies.com, uh, who's going to come in to do our weekend movie review. And we're going to talk with him about all the good stuff that's fit to print um, for the streams and the movies and uh, everything else. So uh, that's uh, coming up at the end of the show today. So uh, just just go out there and enjoy yourself. All right. Uh, phone lines are now open and we're going to uh, take some phone calls as well. Uh, but let's go over first <clears throat> before we before I start taking some phone calls here. Let me go over first and tell you about this story, because every now and then even a reporter 
even a journalist figures out that there is something there's something wrong with what they're being told. Um, the term gun death has become really popular amongst a lot of the control advocates. Oh, it's gun death. So and so and so so many gun deaths, X number of gun deaths. The problem is, is, of course, gun deaths is kind of a broad category. And in fact, it turns out that gun deaths include a lot of things that most people don't know. So there was an article in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel uh, here not too long ago. And they said they this this uh, author whose name is Diedrich, he uh, he discovered something. Here's what he writes. Gun deaths are rising in, in Wisconsin, but the people affected by it might surprise you. The narrative around gun violence is often limited to urban homicides, but the vast majority of deaths by guns are suicide. In fact, this new report from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel finds that suicides make up more than two thirds of all guns, excuse me, all deaths by gun in Wisconsin. Of 100 gun deaths that occur in Wisconsin, roughly 25 of those are homicides. And then there's another 2% that are accidents or police-involved shooting, says John De uh, Diedrich, the investigative reporter. The idea that 71 out of 100 gun deaths in Wisconsin are suicides was an eye-opener to me and our readers. See, the folks, you know, the, the folks that, that are out there telling these stories, that are out there forming the narrative, they don't want people to look any deeper than the headline, Right. Gun deaths, X number of gun deaths, never telling you that between 60 and 70 percent of those gun deaths are suicides. Now, Dietrich does acknowledge and go on to talk about how, uh, you know, gun owners have a very deadly means to take their own life if they're going to do it. And so it makes it quicker. But that doesn't stop anything. The rate of suicide in Japan is super high and they have no guns. So it really doesn't matter what you use. I mean, if you're going to commit suicide, you're going to commit suicide. The, I mean, that that really is almost irrelevant to the whole conversation. But maybe, just maybe, he's, you know, his eyes are open. I mean, he was shocked by this. The, 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 the verbiage you read the article, and he was just like, he's shocked to figure out that it was mostly suicides. All of a sudden, he's realizing that maybe what he's been told this whole time is not as true as he thought it was. Now, does this mean that he's going to go off and, and uh, you know, he's woken up to that part of the lie? Is he going to help fight back against the, the thing? I don't know. Is he going to combat the constant flow of lies and misinformation? I don't know. But at least he's written this piece and maybe opened some people's eyes to that component of it. All right, let's go over to the phones and see what you have to say. Uh, 907-433-3150, 907-433-3150, powered by our friends at Satellite West. We go over here. Good morning. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Yeah, this is Mike. I'm calling from Wasilla. Hello, Mike. What's on your uh, What's on your mind this morning, my friend? Well, just a quick story. I got out of the military back when Clinton was riffing us all out. They gave us a cash amount, and I was coming home. I was stationed in Dover, Delaware, which is, never mind, I'm not going there. But uh, anyway, I was driving cross country. I had about $30,000 cash on me, $40,000 cash on me. And I'd heard about this asset forfeiture, and something told me to, let's just say, hide part of that money. I didn't have it. It was in a toolbox in a trailer behind my truck. And I got stopped somewhere in the Midwest. The cop asked me how much I had on me. I said, oh, I got 5000 on me. And I'm um, driving to Alaska. And I was driving an old truck. And uh, he called another guy on the radio. A few minutes later, this other cop shows up. And they're standing there talking. I'm like, what? I don't even remember what they pulled me over for. I think I had a burnt out taillight or something. Anyway, he comes back and he goes, well, we decided that we'll let you keep your $5,000 because... Uh, you don't look like a drug dealer and uh, you're going to Alaska. So we figure you'll need that money to get to Alaska. And while they were talking, my wife said, why, why, why'd you only tell him we had 5,000? I said, watch. <laughs> he came back and goes, yeah, we're going to let you keep your $5,000. Oh my cash. God. Yeah. And uh, I was like, great. Yeah. And wait a second. That was yeah. my introduction to asset forfeiture. Yeah. No, wait a second. You're going to allow me to keep my lawful money. Uh, yeah, I mean, thanks, I guess. Uh, it, it, but you're right. 
That's the thing. We're going to let you keep that. First of all, I <laughs> here here's my thing, Mike. I think most of the time, and you you did the right thing. I mean, that's great. I mean, I and I, I but I'm thinking more people need to understand what their rights are when they're pulled over. Because if some cop asked me, how much money do you have on you? I'd be like, none of your damn business. You want to arrest me for that? Bring it on. I mean, it's not, you know, where are you going? Where are you coming from? Somewhere and somewhere. You know, I mean, people, they, 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 walk, them, they walk themselves into these situations in a lot of cases. You did the right thing, obviously, by hiding most of it. But, I mean, I would just, I, I got to be honest, if a cop asked me how much money, how much cash do you have on you? None of your business how much cash I have on me. Why, why would you even ask that? What What does that even matter? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I was in a small town, and I just got a feeling that it was one of those where the police were not necessarily the most upstanding citizens. And it was like, I'm, I'll, I'll answer your questions up to a point, right. and then I'm going to stop, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And uh, I figured that we were probably going to lose the 5000 I was hoping I'd be able to keep the truck. But the way that asset forfeiture law is written, um, yeah, it, it's, you're in a tenuous situation, but you're absolutely right. Now, I'd look at them and tell them it's another damn business. They ask me if they can search my car, and I'll look at them and tell them no. I'm not carrying anything in there I'm concerned with them finding. It's just, you it, it, no, I'm not, it, 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 well, we're going to get a drug dog. Great, go get your drug dog. I'm, I'm not in that big a rush. I'll sit here and, you know, we can we can swap stories the whole time. I'm an ex, you know, law enforcement. I, I know how the game play is played. Right, right. And, uh, you know, how many times, you know, how many times have you heard where, well, we stopped them and asked them if they could search the car, and they said yes, and we found, you know, heroin, cocaine, pot, and all this other crap. No. Yeah, and, no. Uh, yeah, if you, if you have a police officer ask you to search their car, uh, search your car, that means that they don't have probable cause and you have every right to refuse. And if they're asking to search their car, that means that they are looking for something to get you on. So at that point, you say, no, officer, thank you. I do not give you permission to search my vehicle. I actually told a trooper that once like 20 years ago. And he's like, well, what do you have to hide? I said, nothing. I just don't feel like giving up my Fourth Amendment rights. And he just got, he got a little eye and he's like, you sure we'd like to. They, ha they asked three times. They always, it's like the rule of three. They always ask three times. Are you sure I can't search your vehicle? Yes, you can't search my, and then he just let me go and, and in the end. They're, they're fishing for something. Um, I, you know, as much as I, I respect a lot of police officers and stuff, police in general are not your friends in that regard. You just say, yes, sir. No, sir. Three bags full, sir. You do not have my permission. I will not tell you anything other than here's my license and registration. Am I free to go? That should be the, that should be the mantra. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, with asset forfeiture, the way it's going on that, they're trying to work that law into such an aspect that you have to answer the questions or go to jail. Yeah. Well, and I see that. But at some point, I'd rather, you know, lose lose your vehicle, lose your stuff. Oh, man, it's, it's so infuriating. Well, Mike, thank you for the story. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for calling in and joining us today. I appreciate it. All, All right. right. Not a problem. You bet. Uh, we got to go here. We're going to come up uh, on the uh, break. That leaves uh, all four lines open. If you'd like to sound off, 433-3150. The Michael Duke Show continues. It is your home for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio. We return with more right after this. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukesShow.com. Okay, we're in the break. Um, damn. I mean, just damn. Yeah, I mean, why would I even, why would I even answer? I mean, how, what kind of balls do you have to have as a police officer to go, how much cash you got on you? Uh, none. I mean, what? I wouldn't even have told him five thousand dollars at that point. You know, I'd be like, oh, I got a few hundred bucks. We're we're going to Alaska. We may need it. You know. No, I, I'm lying. I wouldn't even answer the question. I would have said, "That's not your business. What does it matter how much money I have on me?" 
<laughs> Where are you going? Well, that's none of your business because why does it matter? Where are you coming from? Well, that's none of your business either. Unless you could show that somehow my vehicle has been, you know, it just, it, oh man, I get so agitated. <laughs> I get so agitated by that. I, the look on the cop, like, again, um, it was 20, at least 20 plus years ago when I got pulled over by a state trooper coming from North Pole to Fairbanks. And he was asking me, can I search your vehicle? No. Well, what do you have? You know, you, you don't have anything to hide. No, I don't have anything to hide. I just don't feel like giving up my Fourth Amendment rights. His eyes kind of flared a little bit. Like he all of a sudden he's like, oh, and he still asked two more times. Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I do not want to give up my Fourth Amendment rights. Well, where are you headed? That way. Where are you coming from? That way. I mean, officer, if you've pulled me over for something, please issue me the citation or tell me what I need to do. Otherwise, am I free to go? Am I being detained? I mean, I, while I appreciate many law enforcement officers, sometimes you just got to look at these guys and go, what are you doing? You're supposed to be upholding the law and you're over here shaking people down this fishing expedition to go through people's vehicles. I mean, I have a, I have a killer story on that. The not allowing pe police officers to search your car. Um, I have a perfect example of why you should never allow police, never give them permission. If they have probable cause, they can do it without your permission, but you never give them permission. Um, and uh, I have a story. Maybe I'll tell the story on the other side. Um, but it, uh, it, 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 it shows you, uh, it shows you exactly why you don't give them permission to search your vehicle, even if you have nothing to hide that, that, that'll be the, uh, why are you stopping me? Are you selling tickets to the policeman's ball? Do you know why I stopped you? You're selling. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, all right. Let's, uh, let's see how much time we got. Um, yeah. Probable cause to search only exists in plain view, right? You have to give them permission. Otherwise, if they don't have a reasonable suspicion or probable cause, they can't do it. And if they don't have probable cause, but they have a reasonable suspicion, then they could bring the drug dogs in, which is a whole nother thing because there, there's a lot of assertions that people, it, a lot of people have asserted that drug dogs can be uh, can be pinged to uh, to indicate when there's really nothing to indicate. You know, it's another example of, uh, you know, there's plenty of videos out there of police officers bringing a drug dog in, having the dog indicate. And then the police officer gets caught on camera actually planting evidence after the dog indicates. Ooh, it's a thing. It's a thing. It's a thing. It upsets me. I don't want to, I just don't want to, it's firearms Friday, baby. Uh, oh yeah. And when they say, all I'm trying to do is help you stay out of trouble. Well, thanks. To which I would say, well, thanks. Am I free to go? <laughs> Am I free to go now? All right. I got two lines on hold. Um, uh, We'll, uh, we'll continue on here in just a moment. The Michael Duke Show. Common Sense, Liberty-based, free-thinking radio. Like, share, follow, subscribe, ring the bell, do all the, do all the stuff and all the things. Let's get to it. Willie Waffle coming up in the next segment. I'm ready for that. I'm ready for the weekend already. That's the kind of day it's been already. Let's get going on. Here we go. What the hell is an assault weapon? Does that mean that if we hurt your feelings, you should consider the Michael Dukes show assault radio? <laughs> okay, we can accept that. Here's Michael Dukes. Kind of a dick, but somewhat funny. <laughs> Wait, did did he just insult? Um, welcome back to the program. The Michael Dukes show, Common Sense Radio. It is Firearms Friday. 
Phone lines are open. We just got talking about asset forfeiture, and my blood pressure just shot right through the roof. Uh, we're going to continue on here. We got two lines on hold at uh, 907 433 3150 on the Satellite West phone lines. Let's go over here and see what you have to say. Good morning. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Morning, Mike. It's Fred. How you been? Hello, Fred. What's going on over in Rhode Island, my friend? Oh, not a not a whole lot. I'm calling on asset forfeiture. You know, this whole thing of the uh, you know the law enforcement uh, people taking advantage of the situation for you know seizing assets. You know, I mean, you're talking. Uh, you, you, we're talking. You're talking a civil lawsuit in like a class action lawsuit, the likes of which people haven't seen in a very very long time. And I'm surprised that the some you know you get together with Judicial Watch or a few other you know the Heritage Foundation or Judicial Watch or some of these other organizations, and then you know have a uh, take take it all totally take it all to the courts. And uh, I'm surprised that this hasn't been done. You know, I mean, it's one thing to hit you know individuals, but then again, if there's a central, it's it's kind of like uh, kind of like a Camp Lejeune, you know, poison water, you know, whole thing. I mean, if there's enough people who are affected by it, they should be able to go to one source. And institute a class action lawsuit over a period of time. Yeah. And I think that will definitely get them to sit up and take, you know, very, very uh, appropriate notice right away and put a stop to that practice. Because not only do you go to the police departments, but who, who can, who's over the police departments? The cities, the, the, the states. So they can be dragged into it too for not exercising proper oversight. To prevent this, uh, this, 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 this mal, this malpractice from you know, uh, existing in the first place. Yeah, no, I think that's a, I mean, that's a great idea, Fred. I agree. I think that there, we should see if there's some kind of way. The Institute for Justice has been fighting these cases across the country, um, and they're pretty smart folks over there. I would hope that if there was a class action option, that they would have taken it. But I don't know. I think you know the biggest thing is just opening these stories up and and showing these stories to the American public because most people don't know what civil asset forfeiture is. They have no idea. They've never heard of it. It's never never come across their radar. But when you start telling stories about people who were, you know, going to invest in a business or buy a piece of equipment or to buy a vehicle or just were traveling with cash or have their vehicle loaned to somebody else who does something wrong and they have all this stuff taken, um, it is I mean, it's anti-American. It's infuriating, and it is really just uh, amazing. And I think the average person would be, person would be astonished by what goes on out there with it. And maybe that just needs. It's like cockroaches. You just well, need you know, more well, light. Up, up until now, it's been like the best secret kept, you know, all around. Because you know, this is the first. This is the first real attention that I've, I've paid to this, you know, actually happening. Because you know, it's one of those things you're not really not aware of until somebody, you know, makes mention of it. Yeah. You know, and uh, like I say, it's just. It's spotty. It's it's spotty in nature because not too many people know about it. But now that you know, if it gets out, like you know, you just mentioned on the show, more people know about it. And and you know, they the you know, you got to look. It's 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 a two sided sword too. You got to look at the police departments, uh, their job. So if there is a drug dealer out there or some criminal activity, yeah, you definitely want them to be able to act on it. But then again, to abuse it. For the sake of just uh, you know grabbing gra- grabbing a quick buck here and there, that, that's wrong. I mean, that's, no, I, that, that 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 I think is where the class action part of it would come into play. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think more exposure is the cornerstone and the keystone to this right there. I mean, if they did an expose about this on Fox News or somebody else, where they actually told the stories of a half a dozen people and how ridiculous it was that they've had cash, f- physical stuff. I mean, there was there's one story of a of a motel it was out on the east coast the motel owners were working with the police in a sting they were trying to i think it was prostitution or something and so they were working with the police in trying to bust this prostitution ring of doing a thing and so they were allowing the police to come in and you know videotape and surveil the johns and the and the and the and the prostitutes and everything else and then like 3 or 4 months down the road the police came down and basically said your your business is contributing to a criminal enterprise. And so they seized this motel, which was worth $1.1 million. It was this couple's life savings. They were an elder and seized it through asset forfeiture. Uh, when they had been working with the police to try and eliminate the crime, they saw an opportunity and they seized it. Fred, that's the kind of stuff that makes me just want to get a bulldozer and uh, and some armor plating. You know what I mean? It's just, it's insane. 
Anyway, Fred, thank you so much for your call. I appreciate it. I got time for one more call here before we run out of daylight. Uh, let's go over here and see what you have to say. Good morning. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Yeah, Paul from uh, Slovakia. Good morning, Paul. What's on your mind? Um, at Firearms Friday, I just bought my first Henry rifle. That's what I called about. But I was a cop, and then they got me thinking about the other things you were talking about. <laughs> I never used that. I never asked to search a vehicle unless I had uh, cause. Um, and, dr- and, and drugs with teenagers was never a cause to me. So, right. Well, I mean, uh, but I, that's I good. That new Henry Homesteader, which is, yeah, that new Henry Homesteader, it, uh, it's an awesome little rifle. And uh, I think I got the first one in Soldatna. Nice. What I haven't even seen it yet. What so is the I, Henry I, Homesteader? Is it a lever action? What caliber? Okay. What is- no, it's a, se- it's a semi automatic. It looks like. Remember the Remington 442, uh, 742? It was uh, a lot of guys had them. It, it kind of looks like a small one of those. Um, it's semi-automatic, and it has in the on the magwell. You get different inserts. So I got the Glock insert, and you can use Glock mags. It's nine millimeter. So I can use Glock. I can put a 32 round happy stick in it. I can put a 15 round, you know, Glock stick. Uh, mag in it and i shot it the other day and it was it was really nice well i it was great home defense gun great yeah throw in the i'm gonna i'm gonna gun. have to go check it out that's a that sounds like a great truck gun right there you know that you could do that with different magwell sizes and everything oh, else yeah yeah it really is and then you know nine millimeter is is kind of your um your cheaper rounds nowadays right yeah so, um well, definitely what you want for a nine millimeter, but you throw it so definitely, you, definitely you is a yeah, shoot the gun, definitely uh, a common round, and you can get it for an affordable price. And coming out of a rifle, it's got a little more power to it than out of a handgun. That sounds great. All right, well, my brother, thank you so much for calling yeah. in, Paul. I'm out of time, I gotta go. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio. We're broadcasting live through a series of tubes. Well, it's kind of hard to explain. Sorry. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukesShow.com. Okay. Uh, We are in the break right now. I know Willie's going to be calling here in a second. Let me get my phone, my telephony, and I got to change this over here. Oh, it's all all orange. I got to do orange for the waffle, man. All right. <clears throat> what else do we got over here? Um, um, if it were me, I'd find a police department that engages in routine civil asset forfeiture and dump on them with lawsuit after lawsuit, financially destroy them with legal fees and bad publicity as a warning to others. Um, I agree. Uh, I agree. I think that that would be amazing. Tawny said she'd never heard of civil asset forfeiture before, which again, just proves my point that we need to know that people need to know what's going on. They need to, you know, they need to just have their eyes open to it. It's amazing. Um, Brian also said same thing with Gunwalker, which what he's talking about is I was just talking about the motel that was helping the police and then they turn around and had their assets seized. Same thing happened during the Gunwalker scandal during the Operation Fast and Furious, where the gun dealers across the border were helping the ATF try and track and do all these guns. And then the then the government threw them all under the bus and said, blaming all these gun dealers on the border for selling these guns to criminals. And they're like. I mean, there was there was instances where it was I think it was Wolf Guns uh, was one of the ones in Texas where they had actually called the ATF who had encouraged them to participate and do this. And they said, we don't want to sell this gun to this guy because this guy is I mean, he's sketchy AF. This guy is is bad people. And they're like, no, no, go ahead and do it. And then later on, they threw them all under the bus. It's uh, you know, it's 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 crazy. Absolutely crazy. Uh, But yeah, we, we're going to do a, we're going to do a full show on civil asset forfeiture and, uh, and we'll see what, uh, we'll see what JD two chili can bring to the, to the mix on that. I might go out and collect a bunch of the stories that I've been reading over the years because 
I mean, it will get your blood boiling when you understand what the government, state governments and federal governments are doing. And as JD said, when you've got state governments who have seen the errors of their ways and they try and reverse it and they try and stop civil asset forfeiture, then the feds just come in and tell these different departments, well, you just pass that stuff up to us and we'll do it. And then we'll give you a bunch of the money back, like 60, 70 percent of the take of the booty. And they've seized cars, boats, houses, bank accounts, cash money. I mean, just it, it's, yeah, it is astonishing. You're like, this is America. That can't happen. Oh, yes, it can. Yes, it can. Yes, it has. And again, to the tune of how much, let me, let me, let me look at this real quick. Let me just see how much this. Uh, let me kill that right there. I'm going to kill the phones. Um, uh, how much uh, uh, money comes from civil asset forfeiture? Um, uh, I'm just going to see here if there is a... Uh, oops, here we go. Um, civil asset forfeiture... The total forfeiture, this is from the Institute for Justice, the total forfeiture since 2000, in the last 23 years, across all states in our database and the federal government, $68.8 billion in asset forfeiture in the last 23 years. $68.8 billion. That, my friends, could possibly be one of the largest criminal enterprises in the United States. I mean, you're you're talking about what is that? Twenty years is it three billion dollars a year? Three and a half billion dollars a year on average. That essentially is the is. <laughs> The largest criminal enterprise in the country. Right there. Welcome to it. Hope you enjoy it. It's just just so, I'm just astonished. I'm just, as you could, that kind of, that kind of ruined my Firearms Friday Zen. But I mean, seriously, when you think about that from honest, hardworking, now sure, maybe there's a portion of them that are bad people. I mean, you know, but again, it's old Franklin's, old Ben Franklin's axiom of, I would rather see a hundred bad men go unpunished than one good man, uh, you know, imprisoned, essentially. That is, I mean, I, I just don't even care how many bad people got caught up in that compared to the number of good people. $68.8 billion. It's an astonishing number. All right, we're going to um, we're going to continue here. Um, we're going to be back with more the Michael Duke Show, Common Sense, Liberty Based, Free Thinking Radio, Willy Waffle, Phones Buzzing. We're ready to go. Uh, like, share, follow, subscribe, ring the bell, do all the stuff. Let's get to it. Here we go. Uh, I got to push the button. Okay, uh, we're ready. We're jumping in. It is the weekend. Willy Waffle, wafflemovies.com. This will be the last one for a couple weeks because we're not going to be here next Thursday and Friday. So, uh, yeah, Willie's going to give us the full rundown of everything that's happening. Hello, Mr. Waffle, sir. How are you? Oh, so what you're telling everybody is savor the moment. Yeah, savor the memories. That's right. Marinate in this and just (laughs) suck it up and feel it good and... (laughs) Um, all right. So, uh, entertainment news, let's start off with what I care about, which is Yellowstone. Tell me what's going on with Yellowstone game of Thrones for Cowboys. That's what it is. So what do you got? Yeah. Oh, we got the big announcement today. The announcement was made that yes, Yellowstone season five, part two 
will go into production in the spring. And yes, part two will air in the fall of 2024, leading directly into their new Yellowstone <laughs> show, 2024, which allegedly stars Matthew McConaughey. Right. So that left me with the question, so what does that mean for Kevin Costner? Right. And nobody's talking. Okay. Nobody's like, known, like that's yeah. the pe- yeah. No, nobody's saying, oh, and by the way, Kevin's gonna be with us. I have a feeling this is still under negotiation, especially since his big western film is kind of coming out and he'll have a lot of promotion in the yeah. spring. And uh, you know, yeah, I don't know if he's gonna be available. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. Well, I this could I be pressure. Back, this yeah. could be pressure, right? This I mean, this could be is pressure. The, right, them saying, oh, this is all going on, and now they go back to him and they say, well, look, we've already told the people that it's going to start filming and then it's going to release, so you kind of got to step up here. Um, but, I mean, if, he, he's already... If I been, had to guess... Yeah. Yeah. Go no, ahead. no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just okay. going to say, so, I mean, if, if it's all said and done... Uh, his, I mean, his movie has got to be partially done already, right? So he's still just got to finish it. I mean, it shouldn't be that hard. Well, but it's it's a two part movie. See, it's 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 uh, it's a whole saga, and I think that and that's the thing. Like he was basically saying, between production and editing and promoting, like you guys are going to lose me for like a year to a year and a half. So here's your best chance. Now, here's what I'm guessing. See. If there's one thing I know, it's that a man who's in the midst of a divorce may need a little extra cash. And I have a feeling there will be at least one magical appearance of Kevin Costner in Yellowstone Season 5, Part 2, even if it's just the world's best best paid cameo. Yeah. You know, even well, if it's just for one episode. <laughs> I have a feeling I have a feeling in this case they're probably just kill him off and then that'd be like, oh, so hard. I mean, he was I mean, he's not the I mean, he's 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 kind of the heart and soul of the whole show. I mean, there's other characters yeah. that are all great, but man, so hard when it comes down to that. All right. Well, we'll I guess we'll we'll see how that comes out too. Um, what else is going on? Let's see. Uh Coy- we talked about this last week. Coyote versus Acme yes. Lives, which is Coyote versus Acme was the animated film that HBO, it's all shot, it's edited, it's ready to go, and then they shelved it. Yes. And then they put it on the shelf because they wanted a big fat tax write-off. And um, this caused a lot of anger within the filmmaking community and among fans who were really anxious to see the movie because it just seems like such a gross money play, okay? Like the word is, this movie has some of the greatest test scores you've ever seen for any movie in history. Okay, it's a very, come on, it's the coyote in the road runner. People want to see that. It's a great, great concept. Coyote, after years of using all of Acme's failed products, decides to sue. And, you know, it's just it it just has the hallmark of just a really cool, hip, fun movie. Right. And a lot of the people who are our fellow filmmakers of the people who are involved with Coyote versus Acme decided they were going to protest and they started canceling all their meetings with Warner Brothers Discovery. Oh. And they started saying, you know. Maybe we'll take our product someplace else because you guys don't seem to stand behind what you've got. Well, all of this, plus the public outcry, plus now you've got senators in in Washington saying, we want to investigate why you're doing something stupid like this. Well, now that has made them realize we're going to try to sell the film to somebody else. So the film is going on sale (laughs) and and they're having screenings for potential buyers right now uh, through the end of the month. The, The word is... It may show up on Amazon Prime Video, baby. Wow. wow. So they yep. did test screenings, and the test screenings, the scores were like off the charts. Yeah, just off the charts. That they, they said they have not seen many movies in the history of movies have have test screening scores this awesome. And you know, it's got a good cast. It's got John Cena. It's got Will Forte. Uh, you know, like I said, Coyote Roadrunner. I mean, this just seems like a really cool idea, and I think people want to see it. And they're so upset that this just craven corporation is deciding to scuttle it because they Wait. think they'll make a couple bucks more Wait. on the tax write-off. <laughs> weren't you and I? Weren't you and I not too recently just talking about greedy corporate bean counters and how they were yes. smashing the 
little guy. Yeah. Weren't we just talking about this off the air here a yes. while ago? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. th this is just another some bean counter said, "Oh, we could sell this thing, or we could shelve it and make a lot of money. We'll to get a huge tax write off." You know, forget about all the effort and time and energy and creativity that people put into it. We could get a tax write. Yeah. Uh, great. Yep. Good for them. Good for them. I hope they burn. I mean, uh, I hope it. I hope it all works out. <laughs> so. Um, <clears throat> what else we got? How, what time we got time for maybe one more here. What, give me a, wh right. you choose one. I've done two. You do one. What, what do you got? All right. I will, I will throw out here. I'm going to say it's the end of young Sheldon. My friends, Uh oh. those of you who are big fans of the CBS show, the inevitable has happened. Young Sheldon has grown up. He's too big to be young Sheldon anymore. And the final episode will be airing on May 16th. CBS has said, yep, this, this, this season will be the last season. They're going to do about 10 to 13 episodes, and uh, we will see a series finale on May 16th. Uh, very fitting and very appropriate. The show is ready to end. <laughs> I'm a fan. What is, I watch it a lot. What it's is, ready to end. Is, is young Sheldon, is that Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory? Is that who it is? Yes, it is. Okay, okay. I, it's I, Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. Which I've, I've seen it's, zero it's episodes prequel. of. Yeah, I've seen okay. zero episodes of either. So, But, I mean, I guess people really love that. Big Bang is like a huge pop culture phenomenon. So, I guess, you know, that'll be yeah. good. And, and this became really good in its own right. It became a nice, funny family comedy. And, and, and the problem they're facing is that, you know, like, like we said, it's a prequel. It's, it's Sheldon's life before we met him on Big Bang Theory. And, and the storyline is now getting to some very monumental moments in Sheldon's life that big fans know about. And it's going to be hard for the show to keep going forward or yeah. to deny those big moments when we kind of know they're supposed to happen now. Right, right. So right. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Yep. <laughs> Seven seasons, not a bad run, so I don't know why they would no, be fantastic. too bad about it. Um, okay, I mean, Firefly still only got one season. Not that I'm bitter about it or anything. Um, <laughs> all right, let's move on to the movies. we got four, and we've got uh, about six minutes here. So four of them, you choose. Um, uh, I, I guess the only one that I'm really kind of interested in at this point is uh, murder at the end of the world, but you, you, you drive me, you drive Ooh, the bus here. Okay. You drive the bus. I'm holding, I'm holding that one for last because we're going to have a lot of fun with that one. All right. So let's just get the trolls movie out of the way. Okay. Trolls band together. Okay, the third trolls movie. And I'm just going to say this to you. Dear God, did you think I was really going to go see this thing? I no, no, I've had enough of the trolls. I have had them eat away enough of my brain cells at this point to just say I'm done. Okay. Little kids are going to have fun. You know, people who are, are dying for an in-sync reunion are going to have fun. And the rest of us, well, you know, um, did I tell you there's some better movies coming out this week? Yeah, so yeah. zero, incomplete, I don't care. <laughs> uh, that's a new one. It's negative one to four waffles or I don't care. Which one is it? It's I don't <laughs> this care. This is I don't care. Yeah, okay, all right. So forget <laughs> about the Trolls movie. What's next? Then we've got, you know what? Let's talk about Thanksgiving. Let's talk about, you know, the the ultimate slasher film. And I had forgotten until today, this was one of the phony trailers in the uh, Quentin Tarantino Grindhouse movies. Right. Remember, right. Those, I remember those that phony yeah. trailer. Yeah. This is one of them. And so, you know, it, and I have to say, it's so bad. It's funny. OK, so, you know, it, basically it, it's taking us to to uh, to Plymouth, Massachusetts. We're on Black Friday. These horrible riots break out and horrible tragedy occurs. And now it's a year later. And there's a mysterious killer who wears a, a funny pilgrim mask and pilgrim outfit who calls himself John Carver. And he is now stalking people all Thanksgiving weekend who had some sort of tie to this infamous riot that happened a year earlier. Oh, man. And, you know, that right there made it for me. I mean, you know, there's a lot of really kind of funny, insightful things in here. You know, kind of the idea of, you know, the crash com commerciality of, of what we're doing with the holidays and with right. Christmas and, and buying things and Black Friday and, and you know, going to stores on, on Thanksgiving night, which we never used to do. You know, so there's some of that. And then there's just some outright gory, cruddy stuff that I'm not into, but other people really are. So. I'm at two and a half waffles. Oh, wow. It, 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 it's, it's got kind of a, I think it's got enough of a balance of being sticky and over the top to be funny. 
And then other people who like the horror stuff will just get into that. So this is like a real black comedy, like dark humor. Ooh, kind of, yeah. yeah. And yes. Oh, yeah. And that part's funny. It's just the gore and the blood that I don't get into. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm sure my wife will love it. I mean, that's kind of her thing these days. Uh, all right. That takes us over to the Hunger Games, uh, uh, Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, the prequel. Yeah. And uh, oh man, oh, I God. can't believe they're they're, they're that, gonna do three of these things. That pause. No, you know, I mean, like, <laughs> exactly. I have to kind of steal myself before I I lower the boom here. I mean, you know, it, it is taking us back to when the evil President Snow. Remember him, played by Donald Sutherland. Well, this is taking us back to when he was an eighteen year old hottie, and and you know he was assigned to mentor a tribute played by played by Rachel Zegler from West Side Story. And, uh, you know, we're kind of seeing the origins of the Hunger Games. You know, it, it's kind of the 10th annual Hunger Games. Uh, we're seeing the ways that that uh, Snow kind of improved it and added kind of twists and turns to make it the big spectacle that it is. And, of course, it wouldn't be a teen drama unless, uh, you know, the two kind of, you know, thought each other were cute. Oh, geez. You know, it, yeah, and it's just jumping around a lot. I mean, it's trying to kind of cover a lot of territory and, and only kind of dip its toes in and then move on, dip its toes in and move on. And I think that hurts it a lot. Uh, you know, I'm at like one and a half waffles. I, 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 you know, I saw the original Hunger Games movies. I felt they kind of ran out of steam towards the end. Right. And this is not picking up and giving it steam back. I'm at like one and a half waffles. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, that does take us down to the end here, about three minutes or so with the latest one, the one that I'm interested in, Murder at the End of the World, a Hulu series. Give it to me. This is my new favorite series. This is so cool. So it is a murder mystery. But it's also a character study, and uh, you know we have this this amateur sleuth, this this young gal played by Emma Corrin, and she's a, a sleuth and a hacker and an author, and and she's one of these people who got involved online, you know, kind of trying to solve true crimes, and and we see that her her big um, her big case or her big involvement in a very very famous case, which then inspired her to write a book about it. Uh, we see kind of how that has impacted her life. We go back in time to see her working with her partner, who becomes very important in the story, and 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 how they kind of influenced each other and taught each other, and the all the incidents that led up to the book. But also, we're in the future, and we're seeing her invited to this very mysterious getaway by a big tech giant. Think like if Steve Jobs invited right. everybody to this you know, big resort and they're all the big thinkers and doers of the time. It's like maybe eight of them and someone dies. And that's where our sleuth has to put her hat on because she's starting to smell that something ain't right in Denmark, people. Uh, I love it. And this. so that's what's really cool. Now, I will admit it's a little slow moving. I, I, I have to admit that, but I'm okay with that because I feel like it gives us time to really appreciate, I think, the acting that Emma Corrin is doing, just the way she's creating this character, giving her so much depth and so many different angles and so many different kind of facets of her personality. You know, she's this daring young girl who goes off to solve a murder by a serial killer, Ooh. yet she's not comfortable getting on planes, yeah. you know, like just little <laughs> things like that. You know, yet and we see we see like their paranoia about tech yet they all love this guy who's the big tech genius played by clive owen and they just can't believe they're so happy to be able to meet this guy and go off to his resort and they may not like what they see when they get there oh, so there all those little contradictions i think make it much more interesting i'm at three and a half waffles it's seven episodes long we're two episodes in now and we're going straight forward for the last five baby uh, okay and they haven't dropped them all of course because it's hulu i'm sure <laughs> that's right Bastard. disney wants to make its cash baby yeah all right <laughs> well i love me some clive owen especially when he's a bad guy he's only done it a couple times but he plays a good bad guy so <clears throat> I can't wait to see what happens with that. Willie Waffle, wafflemovies.com. Thank you, my friend. I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you the week after next, okay? You got to eat yourself a ton of pumpkin pie. Oh, man. Big, big grandma face pumpkin pie for the win is what it's going to be. Ooh. I just posted it up on Facebook, by the way, folks, if you want to go check that recipe out for the holiday recipe contest. It's the first post there. All right, we're out of time. We'll see you on Monday. Sarah Montalbano will be our guest.
I'm trying to think of what the movie is that Clive Owen was in where he was the assassin. And uh, he was the bad guy. And, and I can't remember who the he was the antagonist. And mm-hmm. I can't remember who the protagonist was. Um, I guess I could go to Wikipedia or IMDb. We're going to have to look this up because I'm, I'm blanking and I feel bad. Yeah, no, I'm trying to. Re- it's an older one. It's an older one okay. that he did like back in the day. Um, and I'm just trying to not shoot him up. That was this not Sin City. Um, uh, not the Born series. I mean, he's been in so many things. Um, oh, he has. I'm looking it up right now. So keep vamping. Yeah, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just thinking what. It wasn't Shoot 'Em Up, was it? No, Shoot 'Em Up is is one of those Guy no. Ritchie style, very stylized. Okay. Um, it was really, it was really good. Of course, Gosford Park. He was amazing in Gosford Park. Totally different type of movie. Second Sight. About, remember that one where he was blind? Oh that, God, yes. That's a that's that was a really good, a great TV movie. Oh, this is gonna kill me. Uh, it's not Killer Elite. I don't think it's that. No, it, it's it really is no. an older one. Let me see. Uh, uh, Clive uh, uh, Owen. I can't believe we're doing this uh, on uh, live on the radio. <laughs> this but, is this is fascinating, fascinating radio. I know this radio. is great radio right here. Uh, <laughs> here it is. Okay, I see the picture. This is the picture of him. Uh, oh, he was. Uh, it was the born identity. It was it the born. Was, I- okay. Yeah, he played. He played the professor, uh, which was the professorial guy that turned out to be an assassin. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, he's okay. Clive Owen is. He's really good. Uh, he's a really good actor. I enjoy him uh, a oh, lot. Yeah, yeah. But um, I thought he would have made, quite honestly. I mean, I know he's kind of a contemporary of Daniel Craig, but I thought he would have made a hell of a good James Bond. Um, oh God, yeah. With uh, he yeah, had that, he, he would have been the same type of James Bond. I think that, that Daniel Craig yeah. was, you know, kind of kind of this rugged guy, this tough guy, right. but you know, can show that softer side. Can yeah, win the can be smooth, <laughs> yeah, but no. but it can also yep. be raw. You know, the first thing I ever saw a Clive Owen in was a mm-hmm. short guy Ritchie did a series of or no not guy not just guy Ritchie um it was uh who's the guy that did die hard um uh uh the the director Forsyth John Forsyth was he oh, okay or maybe it was anyway a bunch a bunch of different directors did uh these short films for BMW and oh, uh yeah. yeah remember that they were all like six seven minutes I do long remember that yeah and there this one was called the driver and he was driving yes. a BMW for Madonna, who was Guy Ritchie's mm-hmm. wife at the time, which is how they got her in the thing. But he was so good in that six minute little show. I used to watch that all the time because I would I just got such a kick out of it. But yeah, he is a really, really good actor. And I can't wait. I just watched Shoot 'em Up. What was the other one? The pistols. He's got another one where it was like um, um gosh, I can't remember. He he's just he's done a lot of good movies. I should just stop talking yeah. about it because he does a <laughs> lot of good movies, and uh, I really, really, I really, really like him as a uh, as an actor. So, but uh, anyway. well, I think you're going to like the series, and I think what's really cool about the series right now is that you have every inkling that he's got something going on, but we don't know yet. Right. So we're going to have to investigate. We're going to have to pay more attention. We're going to have to catch the clues. And, you know, maybe there'll be a surprise. Who knows? Yeah. Well, I'll have to watch it. I'll have to. I'm. But, you know, you know what's going to happen here? I'm going to wait. You're going to wait until, like, the New Year's Day holiday. Like, yeah. you're going you, to. Are you taking time off between Christmas and New Year's? I am. I'm that taking. That whole week. Yeah. That whole week. Watching it. Yeah. I, that whole week. I'll be binge watching that because I'm not going to do yep. freaking hate that. Um. But uh, yeah, so we're gonna have to. I still haven't watched Ahsoka yet. I still haven't watched. So my 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 dance card I is behind full as well. Yeah, my dance card yeah. is full for uh, for the holidays. I'll be watching a lot of mindless television for the holidays because I've been waiting for it. Um, that but, is what the holidays are all about. That's what it's. <laughs> wait a minute. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Somebody just threw something at the radio when we said that. Okay, folks. Well, that's uh, it for Willie. Willie, uh, what are we going to do when we come back? Do you know anything in the future there? Can you pull your crystal ball uh, uh, out I thought there? there was like a, I thought there was like a Deadly Night uh, movie coming out that first week, uh, December 1st, kind of like a, a horror movie about Christmas. Um, that is hitting me right off the top of my head, and we'll see what else is coming out that week, too. It'll be Krampus 2. 
which is a great movie. <laughs> by, it's a great movie, by the way. But I mean, yeah, definitely. It's uh, Christmassy in the wrong way. Uh, I still haven't watched Silent Night, Deadly Night yet. That's the one that I'm going to watch with uh, with David <laughs> Harbour. Uh, all right. You got it. You got it. It's so good. Get, get it on video on demand like this month yeah. when you're in the spirit for it. Because yeah. it is so awfully funny in all the wrong ways yeah. that make it so right. It's wrong. It's, it, you know, <laughs> it's something that's so wrong. It's just got to be right. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Willie. Appreciate it, my friend. Folks, we will see you on Monday. Sarah Montalbano will be our guest for Montalbano Monday. A little education. And... Uh, I don't know, whatever else I feel like. I'm getting to that time of the year. The show's getting a little weird. We'll see you guys on Monday. Have a great day. We've shed our terrestrial radio skin, and now we are slimy lizard internet people. It's the Michael Duke Show.
Thank you.